This is the Amp Hour Podcast. Released March 10th, 2019. Episode 433. An interview with Sam Strengths. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. Hi, I'm Sam Strengths. I'm a physicist at Cambridge University and I lead a research group looking at new uh, photovoltaic, new solar technologies and lighting technologies. Welcome, Sam. How are you doing? Very good. How are you? I'm great. I'm, I'm ready to talk about some perovskites, which is yeah. a, a word that I didn't actually know until I think <laughs> I watched your TED talk about it and then I reached out and you were very gracious to join us here. Um, what this seems like a new class of materials, but then I start reading, you know, back on mm -hmm. Wikipedia and articles and stuff, and it doesn't seem that new. So, like, how, how new are we talking here? Yeah, so, well, so the, the perovskite is a huge family of materials. So, it's, um, th there's a lot of naturally occurring perovskite minerals uh, in the earth, and, and they've been well characterized over the last 200 years. Um, so, actually, the, the word perovskite um, is named after a Russian mineralogist, uh, perovsky um, and, and they were they discovered calcium titanate, which is the first perovskite. That, yeah, and it looks like the shape is kind of part of it. Is that right? Like the the shape is more than anything else. Exactly. So it's 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 the crystal structure. So it, it takes the crystal structure A B X three, and so in each of the A B and X sites, you can have different uh, different atoms, different ions, um, and so calcium titanate is one where they have calcium, titanium, and, and oxygen. Um, but then there's a whole, so, so this is a naturally occurring class of materials, but then there's a okay. whole lot of man-made perovskites, which are the ones we're working on. Um, yeah. and in fact, they also have quite a bit of history. There's been sort of over the, the last two to three decades. Um, in fact, even more than that, people have been working on these, these perovskites for different, uh, electronic applications. And particularly we have these, we're working on these hybrid perovskites, which have, um, they have organic molecules in them as well. Mm, yeah and yeah the, yeah the, these were sort of these were used for organic transistors in the 90s there's a lot of research going on at ibm uh looking at these materials um and then uh yeah so they were used for, for transistors and they haven't really um stepped forward much in, in that field <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> which um, one, tr one trick pony right now but uh, exactly. it sounds like they're definitely yeah. expanding uh well, I and think it's, that's it, the, yeah, that's the excitement. That that it, so in two thousand nine, then they got they they were first used in a solar cell, um, and that really right. well. So that was the, the the very first use of it. And then twenty twelve, there was a, a big efficiency jump, and that really started this wave of, of perovskite work. Uh, and in fact, ironically, this is now sort of reinvigorating this transistor community as well, as well as many other fields. Oh yeah, beyond just right, right. solar. When there's like research papers around it, I'm sure that people are like, "Oh, I could try it for this and this and this," and then they, they exactly. start using it again. And it yeah. snowballs, and and there's you know now there's, I mean, not just physicists, there's chemists, engineers, material scientists all working on it. So we're starting to invent new new perovskites, new things we can do with them. Um, so so it's very exciting and a huge class yeah. of materials. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And it's good to know too, that it's like, it's more of the shape than it is the actual chemical composition, because like looking at some of these chemical yeah. formulas that, that ABX3, like you're talking about, like mm -hmm. the A is sometimes really, um, really a long chain of something. And then yes. the B yep. is another chain of something. And it's, yep. uh, yeah, that's kind of crazy. And, and, it, and it really completely changes the properties. So if you have a really long A, uh, for example, an organic cation, you can make these layered structures. Um, and they're very different mm. than if you have a very small A site where you make these three-dimensional, very compact crystal structures, and they have very, very different properties, even though it's a very small change. Mm. Okay. What? Uh, so before we before we jump into the technical stuff, what, yeah. what would you say the the level of um, of knowledge around around chemical makeup and and mm -hmm. material properties people need to have in order to understand this? Um, well, so I mean. It, from on one level, not very much. Um, I mean, I think that the elements we put in can be a relative can be relatively simple, particularly for the solar technologies. Um, okay. But of course, you could go to a much higher and complex level, which we will probably try not to go there <laughs> today. Um, yeah, no, no, no uh, reduction oxidation, anything like that. Uh, no, no, my, we'll try to avoid my chemistry uh, classes. Exactly, is haunting me from the past. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, and, and I guess that would be a question for you then. How, how do you consider yourself? I mean, are you a material scientist? Are you a chemist? Yeah. Are you an electronics person? What, what, is, what, do, you, what do you feel like you, you are? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, my, my background is as a physicist, and I, I would say uh, I'm mostly a physicist, but I do certainly you know, don the hat of a chemist and, and of electrical engineer, of a chemical engineer, um, material scientist very frequently. And in fact, it's, it, I could very well, you know, fit in, our work could fit in any of those departments. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I think that's one of the exciting things that, you know, it, it really is this interdisciplinary work um, that is only enabled by engaging, you know, the chemists and the material scientists and the right. engineers together. Yeah. I, I worked for a year and a half or a little bit more in a, in a Samsung fab mm -hmm. and I went in and I'm like, oh, electronics. And then it's like, oh no, oh, this isn't, this isn't electronics at all. <laughs> I mean, you learn a lot yep. and, and it's great, but it's not, it's not, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's not resistors <laughs> yep. unless yes. you're making the resistors out of something. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, but I have learned a lot in this process as well. I mean, it's, it's, it is very exciting because you do learn a lot of different fields and you have to yeah, learn them very definitely. quickly. Well, and it seems like, I, I mean, you're on the edge of research as well. So that, yeah. that you'd kind of have to, you know, I read, I read about the, you know, uh, the transistor in the early, early days, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, what's that book that I like? I have it up here in my loft somewhere. Um, the, uh, about the, the Bell Labs, the idea factory. I read that yes, stuff yeah, in about, mm -hmm, yep. um, great book, but like, you know, the, the stuff that they were doing, they obviously had big teams as well, but like they had, they had chemical, um, you know, chemists, they had material scientists, they had mechanical engineers, electrical mm -hmm. engineers, everyone. So you have yep. to be really, really cross-platform. Exactly. How did you, uh, how did you get to this point then? So you started in physics, but let's, yeah. let's st take a step back. Where, where did, where did you get started? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I so I was uh, obviously raised in Australia and, uh, I, um, in much sun sunnier climbes, at least than here in Cambridge, UK. Um, and, um, so I, for my undergraduate, I, um, I generally, you know, like physics, I like science in general, couldn't decide what I wanted to do. So I did a very general science undergraduate as a bachelor of science, um, and actually a bachelor of arts. So I was oh, nice. you know, co covering uh, sort of physics and chemistry as my majors for the science, um, and then uh, applied maths and actually German studies for my, um, uh, for the art side. Um, wow. So quite a broad uh, undergrad background, um, and so yeah. So I mean, I enjoyed a lot of the work on on particularly light and how light interacts with different materials, and and um, and sort of that naturally engages physics, but also chemistry of the different materials. Um, and actually, my master's project, I actually uh, I wanted to do a, something joint physics and chemistry to bridge them both, and I ended up uh, doing a, a very interesting project looking at protein aggregation in, in white wine um, where so so one of the big problems for the wine industry is actually um, the, the, there's these proteins that aggregate and start to form wine haze uh, in, in white wines in fact any white wine could have, mm. have this problem uh, and so what the wine industry does is actually they use clay to filter out these proteins so they oh, lose really? a lot yeah. <laughs> and, and they're still the state of the art method today uh, so they lose a lot of wine. There's about ten percent of wines lost through this process, through literally filtering oh, it through clay. It just gets absorbed, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so there's some, you know, somewhere. Uh, there's a there's like a, a rat at the bottom of a clay barrel, just drunk <laughs> off his ass, exactly, like yeah. and white wine. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So so there's you know it's a fifty million dollar plus problem for the wine industry. Um, yeah. And so one of the problems is that they don't actually know how this aggregation happens. And and so my project was looking at how how these proteins bind together, um, you know, so that if you know more about it, then you can start to target ways to to prevent it from happening. Yeah. Um, and so that was very interesting as, as some you know modeling of of how proteins stick together and and in fact it's, it's in some ways similar to um, uh, aggregation in Alzheimer's and how proteins oh, form these like the plaque stuff and exactly stuff like yeah. That? Yeah, so they yeah. form these fibrils, um, and it's a similar way in wine, although they're a bit more amorphous and a bit more blobby-like. Um, but but there are parallels there, and some you know the modelling can in some ways help both. Um, so that was a very interesting start, um, and and it was actually very nice because I was working for the Australian Wine Research Institute and and the University of Adelaide, which is where I did my undergrad, and mm -hmm. they had a very nice policy that because uh, they were the testing centre for the wine uh, for for wine for all. Um, wineries around Australia, um, so they would every winery would send in two bottles, one to test, and one as a as a backup, just in case they had to test again. <laughs> <laughs> you see where I'm going with this, uh, yeah. So so every um, every two months they would give a you know the leftover wine uh, out to the staff, so you get a, a case of twelve wine 
uh, wine bottles, um, although half of them were usually very experimental, <laughs> but the other half oh, were yeah, very, yeah, very yeah. good. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, you know, you got to test them, you got to try them out. Yeah, I'm sure exactly. you were very popular in the, uh, you know, the, the yeah, grad student it, population. Exactly, you know? it was, yeah. <laughs> not, not a lot of extra dollars to go around for no, the, no. You know, that. <laughs> but wine's a good currency. <laughs> uh, that's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah, so so that, and that's where I really, you know, engage in this in this concept of trying to bridge physics and chemistry and trying to merge these these worlds that typically are quite quite separate and and like to keep themselves quite separate <laughs> i've found yeah um and then so i so that was so so that was 2007 2008 um and then i i was awarded a, a road scholarship to uh, to go to oxford to do my phd um that was that was the end of 2007 i was awarded that um which was very exciting and and took me on a whole new adventure across across the sea to the uk yeah that's 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 quite a distance actually yeah. yes yeah exactly across <laughs> the sea in many lands um and uh yeah and and so that was in 2008 when i arrived in oxford and and you know completely new place and a very very different uh place and and um, but a very exciting place and lots happening um and so you know beyond just just the academic work um but yeah so there i i started working on um what's called so carbon nanotubes are really tiny cylinders of carbon and um yeah they're sort of so there's the size are about a nanometer in diameter so a billionth of a meter um yeah and the idea what we were trying to do was was wrap po- uh, polymers around these nanotubes and these polymers can harvest light and absorb light um and so for example sunlight and then they could energize electrons and those electrons could inject into the nanotube and then zoom along these nanotubes to to electrodes. Um, when the, the I, I, it feels like I've, I've been seeing less about nanotubes these days. It seemed like it was very yeah. popular for a while. What what kind of happened? Yeah, all yeah. That stuff? Well, it's yeah, no, it's an interesting one because I mean, it's so so f- for carbon. Um, you know, there's there's these fullerenes, which are just basically balls of carbon, and they won was the like buckyballs. Pri- buckyballs, exactly, and, and you know yeah, they won yeah, the Nobel yeah. Prize for that. And then graphene was was uh, the last. You know, in 2005, there was a Nobel Prize for graphene. Um, which is the the flat version of carbon. Um, so nanotubes are, are sort of the odd one out. They're they're the you know they're, they're very promising, very exciting, but that, yeah they've they've you know they're sort of I suppose stagnated a, a little bit. Um, and I, I think one one of the big problems is that um, when you make nanotubes or, or just when they when they're made in the lab, you make both metallic and semiconducting nanotubes. And it's very, very difficult to to separate them out. <laughs> we um, need a grad student with like really, really fine tweezers, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and a very good microscope. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and so and that a couple bottles is, of wine to, to smooth, smooth the uh, smooth the hands and everything, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and so, and so that that literally has, I think, been a big part of what's what's stopped them from being at least commercially used. That I mean, they're very promising. They you know they're very conductive. Um, they've got some pretty amazing properties. So, for example, uh, you've probably heard about this space elevator concept. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so nanotubes are a material that actually could could be used for that. They're light. They're strong enough that they could hold. You know, this is a tether going up to a satellite, for example, um, that you could transport things up uh, from Earth. But they'd be strong enough that you could hold that could hold um, its own weight, um, uh, but it was not too heavy that it would you know collapse. Um, mm-hmm. but obviously that's, you know, that's maybe a bit more science fiction or <laughs> yeah. wonder whether that will ever happen, but, um, right. but, but also for transistors and other things, they could be very promising, but just because you've got this problem of, you've got a whole lot of different types of tubes, it's very hard to sort them. Um, and, and that's a big issue. And it feels like it's that, it's that, you know, manufacturing piece that transfer, that, the technology transfer, which I'm sure we'll get into with your, with the company you're involved yeah, with, but yeah. like. It's like that is always, you know, like reading, like I, I've learned to tamp down my enthusiasm when I'm reading like my <laughs> MIT technology review where I'm like, oh, oh my God, yeah. the future's here. And then it's like, yeah. oh, like, wait, no, <laughs> yeah. that one still uh, hasn't happened yet. You yeah. Know? I, I get friends all the time sending me, you know, articles they've read about, you know, the new, the solar roads and all these things that. No, oh, well, know. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a hot topic around here too, but not in the, yeah, not in the yeah, positive yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's sort of, yeah, I mean, it, you, you, it's hard to sort of, read between the gimmicky versus the the realistic um 
And uh, yeah, although we should never dampen our excitement because there's always exciting things. I, well, but, uh, I, I feel like I have to stand in for, you know, so Dave wasn't be able to join us because the, the as you know, the, the time difference between the, you know, Europe and the US yep. and Australia is, is splitting the world in three. So that's always tough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Dave is a big fan of debunking. And uh, I think yes. he just talked about some graphene or some heater element that was based on nanotubes or something like that. Yeah, too. yep. Yeah, so, but okay, so let's get back to this, the real, the, you know, the stuff <laughs> that you're, you're doing though. I mean, so like, what, so what made you transfer out of nanotube research into something else then? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so the, I finished my PhD in, in 2012 um, and then um, was looking at next opportunities. My wife actually had another year of her PhD to go herself. Um, and uh, so I was looking at opportunities in Oxford and there was so another group, so, so I did my PhD in, in a group, a carbon nanotube group, but another group, uh, which is Henry Stath's group, um, they worked on, um, so also in the physics department in Oxford, they worked on what's called disensitized solar cells. Um, so these are these are um, solar cells that basically have a, have a dye that absorb light really well and then they inject mm. their charges into in, into other materials that, that transport them and collect them electrodes. Oh, it's like a collector, um, like a... Like a- like a flower or something, where it's yeah, you're kind sending of, yeah, it down the stem yeah, or something. Exactly, <laughs> it's, it's just it's just literally like a dye that absorbs and that's it, and then it creates electrons huh. or energizes electrons, but then doesn't serve much for the purpose. Um, so, so mm. I, you know, I'd, I'd been my background at that point was then new solar technologies in terms of the carbon nanotubes and various other things, um, and so I was keen to join Henry's group, um, and just so it happens at that. The, the time I joined it was the summer of 2012. Then it also had this, they just had this discovery of these perovskites in the lab, um, this, this reemergence of the perovskites that, that came. Um, so there's a graduate student uh, in, in Henry's group who'd, who'd been to Japan on a, uh, on a collaboration visit. And with the Japanese group there, she developed these perovskites. Um, and so they, I, I actually didn't know that they'd had this discovery in this paper. It was all sort of a little bit, you know, secretive because it was very new and, and, you know exciting and we didn't know what to uh you know what was going to come from it um and so when i joined the group within about know, what, two, two to three months um that whole group that was working on of about 20 people that was working on disensitized solar cells had pretty much transformed entirely to perovskite <laughs> solar cells, the right turn is, and it was just like yeah, okay exactly. yeah we're uh, doing this huh? yeah. yeah absolutely amazing t- turn in very sh- short space of time Right, um, which and, I mean, maybe you can give us a feeling for like does does that happen often in research no, groups? No, not not entire groups changing. Uh, you know, okay. I mean, it, it, I mean, in the end, it's still working on solar technologies, but it's just a completely different solar technology. Um, yeah, I mean, I I really haven't heard of that happen um, at all <laughs> from my experience. Yeah, um, I, I mean, like my my image of the academic world in the research realm is like, you know, you're 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 in five year chunks of time like obviously you're doing a lot of stuff you're yeah, publishing around yeah. a lot of different things but it's these timelines because you're either on grants or you're you know you're you're doing these longer longer yeah. timeline kind of things exactly so. yeah and so and so there's wider programs you're developing and, and yeah so it's very rare for it to yeah for, and i mean to be fair it's very rare for such a discovery to come along as well that sort of and and the discovery that you can very quickly transition into um, right. and maybe we'll get right. onto and that, that. That curve, yeah. it sounds like if you're if you're going up the curve that fast, it sounds pretty amazing as well. Yeah, yes, yeah. And obviously people <laughs> are excited to work on it as well because there is this, you know, right. very rapid progress. Okay, so so they so you said two thousand nine was the first one. Was that the in Japan? And yeah, then... so that was yeah. So Tom Miyasaka, um, a professor in, in Japan, who um they they made the first perovskite solar cell. Um and this was actually nice. using a, it was basically a disensitized solar cell. Um a type system. So here the perovskite was the dye so that it was absorbing light. Um, it was a pigment basically um, that could absorb the light. And then these dye sense, those cells are engineered so that they have these, um, these, these metal oxide scaffolds. So they're basically a scaffold that supports mm. the perovskite. And that's also an electrode. So that, that metal oxide scaffold actually transports the electrons to an electrode where they're collected. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so they made the first one in 2009. It was, um, so the efficiency of, of the sunlight to electricity, uh, was about 3%. Um, so not, not, not that, you know, <laughs> not mind blowing and, and certainly not game changing at that point. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so it wasn't really, you know, no one really caught onto it, um, it sort of overlooked, um, really until 2012. And that was from the graduate student, Henry States group who went to visit the group there, um, to start working on them, on these things. And, and and that kind of then reinvigorated it. Um, yeah. And and one of the it was it was actually quite funny because one of the 
one of the things that actually made it work was actually a, a, a mistake in the in, in in the amounts that were weighing out <laughs> of the materials <laughs> to make See, the solution. That's how myths are built, though. You know, like that's how it, you have it, to have it happen. You know, exactly, exactly. It would, and, and you know, I think you think back on it and wonder whether we would have completely overlooked this. <laughs> you know, even till today, if this right. hadn't happened. Um, right. So, that's like yeah, the, so, the the apple the apple falling from the uh, you know proverbial tree. Did it actually happen? <laughs> Who knows? But in this case, yeah, maybe exactly. it's you it's, know. It's, Grabbing, grabbing the the wrong size beaker or something, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it was new, it was weighing, it, it was actually flipping around the ingredients and 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 oh, nice. doing them in the wrong. <laughs> so, so double one and half the other one. Um, nice. Yeah, and and so and then the solar cell just worked. It suddenly so that three percent suddenly went up to ten percent, and that's oh wow. In, in the okay. scheme of a solar cell, that is a huge breakthrough. And that's, yeah, and that, right, right, right. And, and these, you know, the dye sensor those solar cells were typically three to five percent. And so, in you know, in a lab that's mm. the record is five percent or, or, or around that sort of order, right. when suddenly it goes yeah, so to ten percent, break, break the record out of the gate would be pretty yeah. pretty impressive, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that that was certainly a game changer. And then that you know that was uh, summer of twenty twelve, and all of that was uh, you know there was a paper submitted, and then the work was very quickly transforming into this into, into working on perovskites. Um, mm-hmm. And and so the other, I suppose. You know, why the big jump? Um, so, so these the, in in Japan in these dye sensor solar cells, um, they were using a liquid layer. So the the layer on top is actually a liquid electrolyte, and that's the other electrode. And that meant it was very unstable. So it would actually start to dissolve and degrade the the perovskite material. Mm-hmm. And so one of the big jumps that took it up to ten percent was that was the graduate student replaced that liquid layer with a with a solid state layer. So, so, oh, so, a similar, a similar kind of makeup, but just it didn't have the exactly. same, the same it mobility was, of. It wasn't liquid. So. It was, yeah, it was just a solid yeah. layer of a, a film, and then that mm. helped to help to jump it up to ten percent. Could you give us an idea of what the the what early days of research like that looks like? So, like, yeah, are, are you doing like designs of experiment? Are you doing like, I mean, are you in? Is it uh, does it look more like a chemistry lab? Does it look more like a semiconductor lab? Like, what does <laughs> mm-hmm. it actually look like in there? Yeah. So, as in now or, or back then when we were doing this. Um, I'd say back yeah. back then would be good. Yeah, I mean, okay. like, or you could give a general case too, because yeah. I'm sure it's going to trans transition. So I think I would say mostly looking like a chemistry lab, in that most of these materials that we're producing, we we solution process them. So they're typically you know, we make they're, they're powders. We make them in, into solutions, into um, so we mix them up and dissolve them, and then we 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 typically spin coat them down. So what we do is we take some of that solution, we put it on a on a glass a glass substrate. And we spin coated at a few thousand RPM, and that makes a very nice uniform film. Um, and so th- that's a lot of the, the processing kind of work is is wet chemistry. So the the typical lab, you know, you, we would see you'd see fume hoods where students are working in. In fact, at that time, it was all in a clean room as well. So they're we're not only in, you know, we're in the bunny suits as well, <laughs> uh, in the fume hoods. Um, and then also, so some of the work's done in nitrogen glove boxes. So here, this is, um, so, so I don't know if you've seen those, but, you know, the gloves, um, which is sort of bordering more on the semiconductor fab type outlook. Or right. lab look. Yep, yep. Um, but, but there, it's in nitrogen so that it protects it from the environment, protects the samples from, from any oxygen or, or moisture. Um, yep. And so and so half the work's in that. So, so there's a chemistry aspect, there's, there's the semiconductor fab type aspect. And then we have um, metal evaporators where we deposit down electrodes, um, which is again more the semiconductor s- side. Um, but then the testing is more the physics side, and that's where we have so so we test them under a solar simulator. So we have a big light source that reproduces or replicates the sun. Essentially, um, it's it's very much standardized of what what we define as as one sun. Um, so the, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Nice. The, the, the spectrum and and the intensity of the light is is you know defined and fixed. Um, it, I think it's it's it ends up being something like the average of of the contiguous U.S. states of the, of the illumination intensity you see there. Mm. Um, Chicago is bringing that uh, average down. Yeah, days, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, south, um, the south helps out, I guess. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Um, which is ironic because I always look at the sky in Cambridge and note and see see cloud as well. So it's yep, yep, <laughs> certainly yep. not holding up. I'm here. sure you have like some grad students that are like just slightly above average in terms of like you know vitamin D and, and you know yes, lack of yep. you know, seasonal affective disorder just because they're working under those lamps. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, this is the other thing. They're in dark labs, yeah, all the time. 
Um, yeah, so and then and then so the physics, yeah, so sort of looking with solar simulators, but then we also do a lot of and even back then and also now in my lab, we do a lot of work um, looking at, at lasers and how sort of putting pulse light onto these devices and seeing how they respond. Um, and I'm sure that's something we can we can get onto. Um, yeah, definitely. Because um, because that's sort of a nice way to look at you know when you energize electrons, how long they can live for, um, right? How many you can energize and and and. How, you, how well you can collect them at electrodes. So like, so now we're kind of moving into the perovskite era, right? And, yeah. And yeah. man, I, I hope it gets called the perovskite. That'd be cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a good, it'd be um, great. <laughs> so could you, could you compare us against uh, silicon or just, you know, generic yeah. photovoltaics these days? Like how do they differ, mm-hmm. especially like in the processing and, and everything yep. like that? Yeah. So the, well, so, okay. So the solar cells, most, People see on roofs, you know, the sort of the dark blue panels. Um, so they're crystalline silicon um, is is the is the technology. Um, and so the the main thing that differs is is what the I mean what the absorber layer is. So in this case, this is silicon, um, mm-hmm. and and usually it's it's two types of silicon brought together to make a p-n junction, um, and and then you have electrodes attached to them so that the you know you you, you illuminate them and then energize electrons and holes so that a hole is, you know, a, a lack of an electron, which we, we have to consider in this sort of situation. Um, mm-hmm. And then the electrons yep. and holes are collected at opposite electrodes. Um, and yep. in many ways, that a silicon cell is very similar to a perovskite cell. It's just that in, in the case of the perovskite, you have a different absorber there. The perovskite is the absorber. Um, but it's a similar style that you have electrodes then um, to, to, to collect um these uh, the energized charges um what where it differs though is that silicon is is a very poor absorber of light um so okay. it's, it's right. got it's got what's called an indirect bang gap so you need this multiple complicated processes to be able to absorb a photon absorb some light and energize an electron um so you have to make them very thick so the typical solar cells are um something like so a few hundred microns thick um, which sounds very thin, actually, to be fair, but it is <laughs> in, in the sort of semiconductor, uh, you know, uh, sc- scale. It's quite right thin. when you're at nanometers. When you're at nanometers, yeah. you know, then your orders of magnitude exactly. above that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so these are, you know, something like a fraction of a mil- millimeter in thickness, um, and to be able to absorb enough light. And so, yeah. so the design of the cell is a bit different because then you have to manage how you get your electrons and holes out. And I remember, I remember from like seeing like the super super high end like triple absorption uh, photovoltaic cells they yeah. put on like like satellites, and yep. that was meant for like different. Wasn't it like they have different layers that have different absorption levels yes. to get more light in there? Is yep. that right? Yeah. So these multi junctions then, so they have different different absorbers which harvest different regions of the, of of the solar spectrum. So some will harvest the redder wavelengths, some will har- harvest the bluer wavelengths, um, and and that you can essentially add together and get a much higher efficiency than if you just have one layer absorbing light. Um, yeah. and, and what what are the what are the standard efficiencies these days? Like, so if you say you look at someone's roof, you're like, that's probably this much. You look at a, <laughs> a, a satellite, it's probably this much. Like, what are those yep. are- areas? Yeah. So okay. So so the record silicon cell in a lab is is it's about twenty seven percent efficiency. Um, that's on a small scale, relatively small scale cell. Um, when you connect those cells together and make a module, um, then that drops to about 20%. So the, the full module okay. that you, so the panel you see on a roof is about typically at best about 20%. They're usually about 18 to 20% efficient, um, because there's losses in the scale up and the engineering of, of a full module. Um, so for, so yeah, so so if we talk about just say the record lab cells, so twenty seven percent. So perovskite at the moment is is at twenty three percent. It's coming for it. It's coming for it exactly. <laughs> if I, yeah, I was yeah. at, at a conference last week and there was there was an announcement of a twenty four percent record now. So that's it's actually jumped another one percent uh, very recently, which is which is actually quite staggering. Um, but but then if we go to the the multi junction cells, so these you know very high efficient. Um, quite complicated stacks. Um, I, b- I believe once the, the record triple junction is about thirty nine percent, which is very impressive. It's it's a very very amazing um, you know semiconductor stack um, because there are you know I'm not sure how many layers there are in total, but there are many many layers that are all optimized. Right. 
and just squeeze. It just sounds real expensive, out. though. It you is. Know, like that, they, yeah. they, <laughs> those aren't those aren't the ones that you know someone's putting on their house from Solar City. No, right? exactly. They're... No, um, and and this is the thing that you know you, you can get this high efficiency, which is great. And so, for example, space applications cost is you know really doesn't matter. Um, right. They're perfect. You, you want reliability and exactly. everything else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, reliable and producing a lot of power. That's that's essential. Um, I mean, the silicon cells, even the complexity is, I mean, it's quite complex. There are lots of different layers, um, particularly they, um, so for one thing to actually make the silicon pure enough, they have to bake it at very high temperatures, um, which, which Mm -hmm. does cost a lot of energy as well. So sort of typically 900 Celsius, um, they have to heat it up to, to bake out. Um, defects and, and other blemishes. On, on that topic too, if people haven't seen, there's YouTube videos of people doing it. So uh, uh, Sam, who's been different, Sam, who's been on the show, he's he's mm-hmm. done uh, uh, transistors at home. Jerry Ellsworth, who has done um, transistors at home, just showing that kind of stuff. There's diffusion furnaces. Those are the kind of things yep. you're talking about, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, and and then there's other layers as well of passivation layers and things that help to just tweak that efficiency up even further. Um, and then the multi junctions, obviously, are, you know that complexity goes up again. Um, and I think, and that's really where the perovskite advantages come in. I mean, that's you know the, they're very very simple to process. Um, and in many ways, the solar yeah. cell we make, you know, we take an ink, one of these these solutions that we've made, and just cast it down. Um, you can also inkjet print it, for example, and make the absorb layer. <laughs> and then we just sandwich them with with two electrodes, and you've got your solar cell. Um, so it's all very low temperature. Oh. You know, to sort of 150 degrees Celsius maximum, which which is very important from an industrial processing uh, yeah. aspect. Because a bunch costs, of people in our audience yeah. just just gasped as you said that. Not, <laughs> I mean, obviously it's very amazing, but also because I've been talking about printed electronics for a long time. Ah, yes, and yeah. uh, there's been this ongoing debate. And so, what's I mean? So, I guess we're talking about solar cells, and that's mm. uh, you know a simpler kind of thing. Yep. Uh, is this moving into transistor stuff at all, or is this kind of still pretty far off in semiconductor space? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there is there is a lot more work, especially in the last year, coming out on on transistors uh, of these materials. Um, what I think one of the big issues, particularly for transistors, is that um, is that you have uh, so, so, and one of the limitations of these materials is that there are, are ions that can move in them. And mm, so it. when you want, you know, quite fast switching, for example, um, the, the response time m- might be limited by how fast the ions can move. Um, right. Or even whether you can have good kind of on-off behavior, whether you can actually make the ions move enough to ever have that. Um, that's where the challenges lie. But but it's certainly there has been some breakthroughs in the last in the last year, at least. I mean, it, it, it probably is possible. Um, and, and that's really quite exciting, I think. Because it, it does open up printable, you know, printable transistors, printable electronics mm-hmm. um, beyond. Yeah, just and like large, large scale stuff to start with. It's not like you're going to do a seven yeah. nanometer transistor right away. No, but no, uh, you know, exactly. doing like a transistor is kind of cool. You know, yeah. like a two N thirty nine oh four. Why not? Yeah, let's do exactly. it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and then you know, if you, I mean, if you make them cheap enough as well, you can make you know many many of them and put them out mm-hmm. in the field anywhere and just think about you know all these Internet of Things type applications. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 all possible, but there's still there's a long road ahead for that, at least. Yeah, definitely. Well, and like you said, it's the the focus is coming back onto it with with the research now. So that's yeah. uh, that's an important starting place. Yeah. Now we're at perovskite. Mm-hmm. How does it work? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So we're back to this ABX three. Is that right? Yep. Did I, did I remember that right? That's right. That's exactly right. So how do you, how do you get started with this kind of thing? Like so. Maybe what is the simplest version mm-hmm. of a perovskite that, that you're making currently? Yeah, so so the, the simplest version we have, so the, so the A is is a very small organic molecule, um, such as so methyl ammonium. So this is a, a I see it's a, it's got a nitrogen group and then a carbon group attached to it with a few hydrogens around. Um, so it's quite small, and and that's the A site. Um, B is typically lead, um, a lead ion, and and the X is um, halide, so iodide, typically. So it's typically so methyl ammonium lead iodide is is our kind of the drosophila of perovskites. Um, Got it. The, the, yeah, the standard system. Um, and so that that has, and that was you know the the first one was used in a solar cell um, that absorbs light very very strongly. So you know I was talking about silicon where you have you know two hundred micro micrometers of of material. Um, here you can bring it down to half a micron, so a few hundred nanometers of, of this film will absorb as much light as 200 microns of, of silicon. 
Wow. Okay. That's that's impressive then. What about the materials that are in there too? Like are those, are any of those super hard to get? Because I remember like, mm. is it like indium phosphate? Like, I remember they keep talking about putting more and more crazy chemicals that go into, yep. aside from just the normal, uh, you know, photovoltaic processing, but like mm-hmm. to get efficiencies up there, like indium phosphate, whatever, 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 yep. you know, like lots of weird things. Yep. Yeah. So they, I mean, just, that, that is the, all that's in there. So it's, it's these, these three components that, that sit in a, in a crystal, uh, in, in these ABX3 crystal sites. And the, and the fit thin film is just made up of, of those, um, all these mm-hmm. little, um, unit cells linked together to make a film. But are they hard, uh, hard to get or make? Yeah, like, so, it's like lead as kind of everywhere. I mean, so, yeah, so. So lead, no, they're, they're quite, quite readily available. Um, the, the organic components, I mean, they're synthesized in the lab, but the precursors for those are very easy to make. Um, lead and halides are, are, are mined quite easily and, and quite abundant. So, so at least there's no, I mean, in terms of costs, uh, and, and shortages that there's, there's no issue there. Um, um, so the, the indium is a good example because at the moment we do actually use indium as the transpar- one of the transparent electrodes. Um, and so indium obviously has some issues with, with, uh, with indium running out. Um, so we would have to be looking at potentially other, um, other elements than indium on the, on the electrode side at least. Um, but for okay. the actual active layer or the absorber layer, the perovskite, there's, there's no issue. Okay. That's great. That's really great. Yeah. So what about, so, so you laid this, this level down and, and I guess, mm-hmm. I guess I'm kind of ha- having a hard time like visualizing it. Like, yep. so you said you spin it onto like a substrate yep. and this is like a, a, a juice. It's like a juice that you spin onto <laughs> it a is. substrate. Yep. It spreads itself out. Yep. How do you then, so the, you're mentioning the electrodes, but how do you actually make that physical connection? Cause it feels like without having like a little tiny soldering iron, I don't really understand <laughs> how it would actually collect these Yep. The electrons like you're talking that yep. makes yeah the- yeah so so maybe I'll talk you through the the, the stack actually because then it might make more sense um, so That's perfect on, on the glass so we we take a glass um, so so in in the lab we usually use something that's sort of half an inch by half an inch a little small glass wafer um, and then on it we have some um, some transparent oxide so indium tin oxide for example um, and that's our bottom electrode so that. Mm-hmm. That's across most of the glass. In fact, it's we usually pattern it so you, it's not completely over the glass. It's not you know, we can just measure a smaller area, for example. Um, and then we put our perovskite layer on top of that. Um, sometimes with a with, with another metal oxide in between. Um, and then that that means that um, there's a direct basically a, 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 um, a planar um, junction between them. So there's just a flat layer between them, and that that is the electrode. So that huh. um, when we energize electrons in there, then the electrons will travel down to that bottom interface and then they get collected directly. Doesn't something need to close the circuit? Like, yep. am I, so, so am then, I yeah, missing sorry. something? Yep, okay. you are. <laughs> I am. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so then we have a, a top layer on top, which is the other electrode. Um, so here we have, um, so it's often an organic layer, which is, which is a, a collector of, for example, the holes. And that's so. So we're basically making a sandwich stack. So we have just a layer on the bottom, then the perovskite, and then a layer on top. Um, and then okay. we evaporate our metal electrodes, a metal metal on top, which is what we can actually contact to measure it. So then we, so and, okay. and usually they're patterned. So we have fingers of those, for example. Um, and then we can oh. come in and and contact one of those, and then um, we make a contact with the, with the bottom electrode with the other pin. And then that, that that then completes the circuit. So does the top layer inter, just interfere with the sunlight though, or uh, like what is? So yeah, I'm visualizing like like almost like a capacitor in this case, where the yep. the dielectric in this case is actually the perovskite. Mm-hmm. But then I think of a you know like a, a parallel plate capacitor. In that case, the sunlight gets in the middle, or it gets in the way of yep. the top plate gets in the way of the light. So what's what's is it passing through something? Yeah. So, so there's I mean there's different ways to do it, but mo- most of the way we do it is actually we illuminate through the glass. And so, um, so, so through the glass, we have that, so that bottom layer, that indium tin oxide, for example, that's transparent. So then the perovskite, we, we illuminate through the glass, which is transparent, and then that can okay. directly excite the perovskite. Um, okay. So there's nothing blocking like it in no. a way, but then on top, obviously, then there's that's opaque to the light, but it doesn't matter because everything's absorbed um, below right. it. Right. 
Um, there are other designs why- um, where you can have where you can illuminate from the top if you have very thin fingers, for example. But that's they're a bit more complicated and 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 more lossy. Well, I didn't realize that indium tinoxide is is transparent. Why why is mm-hmm. that? Um, so so it has a very large band gap. So it's something that um, it, it absorbs somewhere in the ultraviolet region. So it means any light coming in that's um, uh, lower energy or, or longer wavelength than then then the infra- then the ultraviolet is is transparent it passes straight through huh okay um you, you can change the indium tin oxide depending on the doping of it you can you can put other things in it and change the ratios of each of the elements to make it more absorbing if you so chose but the the type we use the particular type is transparent does that mean like what what is the spectrum that the actual perovskite um, absorbs then it obviously doesn't it doesn't get any of the uv light because of the the indium tin oxide yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's some loss from that. Although it's it's um, at least for the for what we want to harvest, there's not a lot of power in that in that part in the in the deeper UV anyway um, that we would lose. Um, so the, the perovskite absorb in principle can absorb everything from um, sort of 250 to 300 nanometers up to um, about 800 nanometers. So it's really quite a, almost all the way across the visible spectrum. So right from the real the blue. UV at 300 nanometers, right to the almost to the near infrared at 800 nanometers. That's great. And and does that compare differently than uh, photovoltaic? Is like certain regions that are different? Uh, so so silicon actually can absorb right across. In fact, it absorbs even to a little bit longer wavelengths. So it actually can absorb a little bit further into the near infrared. Um, um, so so when I say it can absorb to 800 nanometers, that's the typical perovskite we use. So this methyl ammonium lead iodide. Um, but we're we're also looking at trying to tune that to get the absorption, you know, to be able to absorb further into the near infrared as well, like silicon. And and what is the benefit of that? Is just that you absorb more of the heat stuff? Um, no, you can just I mean, it, all of that light that you're absorbing still can be converted into electrical power. So that's still got it. Know, got it. Yeah, even out to sort of so a thousand nanometers, we can still t- in principle convert that into electrical power, and we and we ideally want to as well. Yeah, I guess that ups your efficiency in general, huh? Yep, exactly. Yep. The reason it's not, you know, not very high, sort of even twenty-seven percent is the limit. Uh, is is what silicon is at. Um, the limit is about thirty-two percent for just one layer of material, and that's just because you can't absorb. Mm. Um, you, you just can't absorb. You have to have some band gap, um, and you can't absorb photons at a lower energy than that band gap. Um, Got it. And so there's a compromise in that you um, you want to absorb as high energy as possible to have a high voltage but then have a low band gap to have a high current. Um, and so it turns out 30, 32% is about the limit. And that's like the maximum PowerPoint tracking kind of thing where you're balancing current and voltage. And uh, that's who, that yeah. So, so, or this is just if you had it perfectly, you know, uh, perfect conditions um, where it was perfectly tracking the sun, um, you are limited to about 32%, even everything being ideal. Um, oh, okay. Practically, okay. we'd probably never get to that. Probably about thirty percent is about what we'd actually get to. Um, but that's when multi junctions come in because that limit then goes up to about fifty percent if you can uh, if you have two junctions, for example, in what's called a tandem solar cell. And so, does that mean that perovskite has that same limitation? Yes, of the the band gap stuff. Yeah. So if we just had one layer of perovskite, it would it would also only be able to get up to about thirty two percent. But then we can we can move to to tandems with perovskite, having two layers, for example, right. or, or three layers even of, of perovskite, and really push right. beyond those those limits. Right, and I guess if you're processing simpler and you can get the light through transparent layers and everything, then you could start to have you could have layer on layer and just it's be simpler to 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 stack yes. things up. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yep. Well, you had mentioned the uh, the lasers uh, kind of targeting your like do, for yeah. testing could, could you explain that setup and, and why you do that so what we do we have we have lasers that that produce that they have pulses of light um and so these are very fast pulses so usually something like um a picosecond um so a thousand billionth of a second um or even sometimes even faster than that um and what it does is okay. it, it, we, we we shine them on our samples and we, we we create a pulse of light which then creates a a pulse of energized electrons um and then we monitor how those electrons then um uh, lose their energy so whether they um recombine with uh with each other um 
or they recombine with uh, or they or they reach traps so they hit defects um, and lose their energy or whether they are collected at the electrode and we can monitor all of those things um, and so we can we can get an idea for lifetime of these energized charges and and that's very important because we want to know we want to obviously maximize how many electrons can be collected um, and we want to minimize how many of them are lost to traps um, so it's a very using these lasers is a very good way to to, to measure this and to look at this and then and then we can go back and look at our material and try and optimize it uh, to try and get rid of some of these defects for example and then see if we can improve this lifetime improve how long they're energized for what what causes an actual defect yeah so there's there's well there's lots lots of different types of defects but the, a, a common one is is a missing iron so this abx3 it might have one one site might be missing an x um and so that creates a, what's called a vacancy and um, and an electron could fall into that um, that trap and then and then lose its energy to heat. So does that mean that the the because the X is doing the actual transport of electrons between these different sites? I guess maybe that makes us dig, dig into the structure a little bit yeah. more. It, it, well, it, it's not really actually. So the the full ABX three is involved in the transport. Um, it's just any of those sites that are missing create sort of a, a dip in the energy. Got it. Um, energy mm. landscape, which which an electron can fall into, like a well, sort of like an energetic well, mm. um, and it can't get out typically. Um, but one of the I think most fascinating you- things about these perovskites is that they they have quite high defect levels. So for a semiconductor, actually, there there are quite a few defects there. Um, so something like um, one in a million of these of these unit cells of these crystal sites have a defect. Um, that doesn't sound like much, but it's but it's actually quite a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, it adds up. It adds up. Yeah. <laughs> so these electrons, yeah. um, you know, it really shouldn't be working, but for some reason they are working, and it seems there's this some sort of defect tolerance in these materials that we we don't fully understand yet. Um, and it's a really mm-hmm. quite an exciting thing actually that um, you know we're taught in our semiconductor textbooks that that we need to have a perfect crystal site, crystal lattice, have no blemishes, no defects. Um, and and this is kind of making us rewrite that textbook a little bit because they are working even in, in spite of right. quite a few defects. Well, but you're not using silicon in this case either, right? So. That's true. That's true. And yeah, and, and for yeah. comparison, so silicon has um, about a million times fewer defects than than a typical perovskite cell. Yeah. Um, and if you had the same level of defects as you had in perovskites um, in, in the silicon, you would you would have no operation at all. You, you would have all traps. <laughs> I see all the electrons would be trapped. <laughs> Yeah, well, it makes good for, for uh, good manufacturing and stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. So it seems to be tolerant to you know, and that's why it's tolerant to making them quite easily and and quite cheaply um, because they are tolerant to these defects. Could you explain the uh, so so you mentioned the the entire ABX three helps with the structure. Mm. What about it actually makes that electrons are mobile between <laughs> between this sheet of, yeah. of stuff that you're laying down? Yeah. Um, so, so mo- most of the what's called the band structure. So, what the electrons see. So, there's we have conduction band and valence band. Um, that's that's made up of of the primarily from the bonds between um, the B and the X. So, usually the lead and the iodide. Um, so that dictates how you know what the energy levels are of these conduction bands. And valence bands, and there the that's the region that the electron moves through. Um, so essentially, they all of these unit cells connect together to make um, an energetic landscape that the electrons can move along, um, and that's primarily dictated by this lead halide bonding network. Okay. Um, so, that, so in many ways, they do move along these um, lead and iodide sites. Um, but it's but it's quite oh, smooth so movement. What 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 is the air of the A there for then? Like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a good question. But I mean, the the, the A mainly because um, these lead and iodides are in they're in octahedra actually. They're, 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 the bonding makes them form octahedra, um, and the A's sit at the corners of these octahedra, and they and they they kind of c- c- compress the octahedra a little bit or or expand the octahedra a little bit. So they influence them still, mm. and. And this is one of the interesting things because you can then start thinking about other A sites where you can change how that octahedra is is stressed um, and you get very different properties. 
Um, so the A is still quite important in in dictating how the lead and iodide bond. Oh, sorry. I, I was like, bond to what? I, I, sorry. <laughs> bond to each other, sorry. I was like, bond. Yeah, I was like, oh, so how much they bond? And I thought I thought we'd cut out there. Yeah, was, no, okay, yeah, be, yeah. Of course, yeah. I mean, they have to bond to yeah. each other. Yeah, bond is a verb. I, yeah. I know that now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm I'm looking at the uh, the the. I mean, I'm, I'm you know I, I lean very heavily on Wikipedia in general. Yeah. No, um, and it, it, the octahedra shape you're um, talking mm-hmm. about it. It seems like there's a, a large size difference as well. Is is that is that realistic? Or, yeah. So the the or lead I, is typically quite large, and then the iodide is much smaller. Mm-hmm. So the lead it sits at the center mm-hmm. of the octahedron. And then the the iodides are, are decorated around in an octahedron around that mm-hmm. lead, and so a lot of the properties of the materials we're working in are sort of unique to that octahedron, yeah. And then how it's influenced by the A site. Um, I guess the other thing I think back to about my my semiconductor classes is like thinking about silicon having like the the four donated and the four you know, like the, yep. the the four spots where it all bonds together mm-hmm. and it, like that. If I'm thinking about that right, I guess that's carb- carbon as well. But, but like it, it was very uh, the math seemed to work out pretty well in my mind. Yep. And so like lead is is this really heavy, really large molecule. Like what what about it makes it so that there's that is it eight sites total or yeah? Or, so I mean, like how many bonding sites yeah, are there? So 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 you hear the difference between the, so those those other ones are, are covalently bonded, so they're directly bonded um, materials. Um, so here they're ionic bonds so they're they're ions that sit in sites and there's an energetically favorable situation where they sit happen to sit in octahedra um and the charge is still balanced though because um the unit cell which is the most fundamental unit of this um is still charge neutral it still adds up to be charge neutral um it just so happens that they end up stacking in uh in octahedra um and I think that's the, the interesting thing about ionic systems is that they're somewhat softer and they can have different types of rearrangements, different types of arrangements that can still be energetically favorable. Um, and partly why these materials yeah, have such yeah. versatility as well, because they are ionic and, and you have you can make them move and you can make them, you can substitute certain ions for different ones without changing the structure too much. Right. It seems like uh, with silicon, it's like <laughs> it's so fundamental and low level and like yep. so few things happening there. Maybe that drives that purity we were talking about as well, because if you don't have it, you, you can't really operate. Yes, but yep. It seems like this is a more complex structure in general. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot a lot happening there. Um, and there's um, at least uh, there are some interesting thing, you know, thoughts that it is something unique about these lead halide systems. Um, that you can have um, this defect tolerance is is actually associated with this specifically with the lead and the halides, um, and so for example, uh, when an electron moves along the perovskite, because it's ionic um, and the electron is charged, it actually um, influences the lattice. It influences the other ions as the electron moves, um, and so there's there's this idea that. This sort of the electron has almost like a force field around it, um, which which blocks it from recombining with with traps or with from other charges. Um, it's it's what's called a polaron, where the, the charge itself actually disturbs the other atoms around it, and the other ions around it. Oh, really? Yeah. So there's some very interesting <laughs> okay. physics there that's sort of you know on a you know not completely well known yet, but certainly some interesting uh, fundamental science there still to be done to try and understand that yeah you know that's another thing that like strikes me about like the early days of silicon processing i was watching the, uh, this japanese documentary around the the transistor and yep. obviously they were they were recovering from the war um and so like it seemed like they didn't have as much equipment but probably still you know it, you know similar to what was happening at bell labs and stuff mm-hmm. and it's just like oh yeah they didn't know what was going on at that point because it was still so early and and it seems like we're kind of in that era now with with this kind of thing with this this structure. Yeah, and, and I think I mean yeah, one of the interesting things is that it, it's it's just kept working. So just empirically, the devices keep getting better and better, and our fundamental understanding is still slightly lagging behind uh, the actual you know right. where the efficiencies at. It's sort of it's quite a unique system in that sense. Usually, most photovoltaic technologies that have developed over you know many years, for example, silicon, we knew a lot about them, and therefore we we could make them a bit better because we knew everything about them and, and knew what was limiting them. Whereas these, you know, empirically they've just kept working. Um, 
and and I know at some point we will properly catch up on the fundamental science of it. Um, but but you know until then we haven't yet hit the plateau. That's good. That, I mean, progress is driven from the just keep reaching and hopefully exactly, get more efficiency. Yeah. With, you know, well, as, trying yeah, it out. I mean, know? as a physicist, I hope I hope we do get the understanding uh, and then start really driving it up even even more. But that's you know it is still exciting to see it keep getting better. In the meantime, yeah. Well, and and let's talk about uh, you know some of the unknowns here. I mean, like I look at I look at your um your research site on the on your Cambridge research site and it's like listing all these applications like oh my god you guys are going to use this for a lot of different things <laughs> yep so what are some of the the non-solar applications that that are also being targeted yeah so the probably the the the, the main well at least the, our, our first uh, the one we're looking at the most is is light emission um and so here um in in, in the simplest way it's an led for example is just a solar cell run in reverse so in this situation, we're actually um, injecting electrical charges in, and then making them recombine and then emit emit photons and emit light. Um, and so these these perovskites are uh, I talked about how they're good, very good at absorbing light, but they're also very good at emitting light. They're very efficient emitters, really? um, which, which is really quite exciting because we can have um, you know quite cheap, cheaply processed LEDs. Um, and have very very good color purity. Um, these the emission, um, the 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 widths of the emission spectra are actually really quite narrow, um, and so this is pretty this is very exciting for for display applications. So you can think about having yeah. you know very crisp blue, red, and green emitters um, in a similar way to the OLEDs um, or quantum dot LEDs um, are starting to. You know, starting to show. Yeah, that's that's amazing, it, and it's all. I mean, it's all based on band gap, right? I mean, that's so. That's kind of like what it all kind of comes back to is the it hops down this band gap, it emits at a certain frequency, and same thing with absorption, right? It's absorbing at certain frequencies better than. Yep, others, exactly, and, they, and they're kind of entirely reciprocal. This you know absorption and emission, they're all, yeah fundamentally based on the band gap. Right. Um, at, right. As anyone who knows who has has an LED circuit, and then there the light goes on. <laughs> And they're like, wait, why is there all this noise in my circuit now? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's the fluorescent lights. When they're on, I see all this noise. What's happening? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Um, and so we actually, and quite ironically, we actually look, at, for even for solar cells, we look at the light emission of these materials because it tells you a lot about whether the solar cell is actually, um, you know, is, is operating well. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit counterintuitive that we want to make the solar cell emissive and, and emit light, but it actually tells you a lot, right. a lot about defects. Because if, because um, if you have your charges in your in your solar cell, and um, they can either recombine and emit, and emit light, or they can hit a trap and then lose the energy to heat. Um, so light light right. is actually a very good probe for for power losses in the solar cell, even. Um, and so a lot of these, the laser techniques I was talking about, when we excite them with a packet of, of, of energy of, uh, then we look at actually at the light coming out then. That's a very good, nice way to look at whether the, a region is full of defects or, or has fewer defects. That's really cool. So did I, did I read you guys are also using this for, for laser generation yeah, as so well? That's the other, yeah. So I mean, the, the, so, so they seem to be good for lasing materials as well. Um, and one of the, one of the overall goals is, to, is to make an electrically pumped laser um, so typically we can, we can excite them with light and they can laze. Um, but the, the Holy grail is actually making it so we can electrically inject the charges in, um, like an led, but, but then get lazing output. Um, and, and that's quite a challenge, but it seems these materials could be promising for that. Um, in that we can have very nice, um, nice emission spectra, which is essential for lazing, um, and also very few defects as well. Would that make it uh, for like doing like optoelectronics and stuff like that? Would that yeah. be the the eventual yes. goal? Yes, yeah. So you could you could envisage you know perovskites being used in many many different things. So you've got the solar cell, but then also an LED, I mean, a transistor, a laser. All these different units of optoelectronic units could, in principle, be from a very similar material family and produced very cheaply as well. So what about the? So you had mentioned in trend in perovskite based transistors they have trouble because of turning on and off and transferring electrons through yeah. them does that not apply for like a, a lasing application uh it, it will as well and and that in particular if you need fast you know some sort of fast lasing application um and and it all it all comes back to this iron motion um that could be an issue for some of these other applications in particular 
um, even for solar cells as well, actually, that while you're operating um, and injecting charges, for example, you can have ions that actually move over time. And this could lead to some quite serious stability issues. Um, and it's uh, that's one of the big challenges actually in general in, in these perovskites is to, to try and mitigate that ion motion and try and freeze it out if we can. And that that's just going to be, again, like like studying the chemistry and studying change. Exactly. And, we, and we've found actually some some quite good, I mean, even over the last one to two years, there's been nice breakthroughs there where where this, I, I talked about this A-site, this, this methyl ammonium, very small molecule we put in. Um, we've actually been swapping that out for slightly different molecules that are slightly larger that can actually, that actually stabilize the ion migration um, and ion motion a little bit, at least. So there are hints that there are ways to do it. Um, we're not there completely yet, but the, I'm very encouraged by that, that, that we can do it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where the chemists will really come in, <laughs> will, will come into their own. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so you mentioned the past one to two years. It sounds like you're also uh, cranking out some new things with Swift Solar. So tell yeah. us about Swift Solar. Yeah. So, so I've, um, I'm a co founder of Swift Solar, and there's, um, so, so there's the five other founders. Um, and, um, and so, and so, well, the history behind that was a, a few of us were previously working together in, in Henry State's group in Oxford. Um, I spent some time at MIT um, and, and met one of the other founders there. Um, and a couple of the other guys went to Stanford as well. And so, you know, we're, we're quite passionate about this. So not course. a very well-educated bunch, it no, sounds no, like. Uh, it sounds like you guys are, yeah, right. <laughs> not, many, like... not many degrees in the room. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so, so we've, we've, we've been, yeah, so over the last two to three years, been um, sort of developing these ideas. Um, and what we're particularly looking at doing is 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 making these um these tandem cells so this is where we combine two perovskite layers together um to, to, nice. to really go to high efficiency but but what we're also doing is making it making lightweight um versions of these cells so here instead of putting them on glass for example we can start thinking about putting them on on plastics or on um on metal foils that that are very lightweight and so this has some real advantages yeah. in in terms of um, installation, for example. So you could you could you could think about a, a roll a roll of very high performance solar sheet, like a tarp that you can roll out on your roof, and and you know very easily and cheaply install a panel. Um, uh, you know, one idea would be you know sometime in future you could go to Home Depot and Depot and and, and you know just cut off a solar sheet and take it home and, and roll it out. Yeah. That would be the, That'd be great. the, the ultimate goal, but you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of challenges there, but, but it, really the, the opportunity is, um, is, is, I mean, solar at the moment is, is essentially limited by cost. Um, and one of the ways to bring down costs of not just the actual panel itself, but also all the other things like installation and wiring um, is to go to high efficiency. So really the drive yeah. is to go, you know, beyond this 32% limit to, to these tandem structures that can push us well into the 30s, 30% region. Right. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, I have a guilty pleasure of watching uh, tiny home videos yep. and uh, it, it's embarrassing, but uh, I do. And they, they only fit like four solar cells on their roof and it's usually about like 1200 watts, I think max. And so you're saying like you can maybe make that two and a half kilowatts or you know, more. Yeah, so, well, That's so kind of like the idea. Yeah, the idea, I mean, if, if we think about, uh, you know, let's say today if um, the, the panels are 20% efficient, um, we want to at least take that to, to 25%. Um, and, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is, you know, so it's 20% more power roughly. Um, yeah, yeah. But, it, you know, it does make a huge difference, especially in the economics of solar. Um, plus the scale of yeah, like payback periods and stuff like that. Yeah, the, exactly. They, they come down, but also the scalability as well. Cause one of the limitations of Silicon is actually trying to make enough panels. You know, if we wanted to roll out enough Silicon panels to power the world, um, at best it would take 40 to 50 years of just continually producing panels to get there. Whereas with right. perovskite, you could, you could do that in three to four years in principle. Um, so, yeah. so there is actually, uh, you know, this, this scalability issue as well that, that silicon might not get us all the way there if we did want to take renewables or at least solar all the way up to very high levels um, of deployment. Well, is there any downside? So like, uh, so assuming that it was like printable on a, like a thin plastic sheet kind of thing, mm -hmm. is there a downside to just printing at 20% and, and going with that? Like, I don't, I don't understand the, I, I get some of the economic questions, but like, 
why hasn't this started at the, in the production yeah. side yet? Well, I think one of the issues is that, I mean, well, one of the great things is that silicon is, is, is very good and it's coming down in price very, very quickly. I mean, that's great. Um, and so what, what's actually will happen, and in fact, it's already happening, is that the, the cost of the actual module itself, the, the material on the panel, will be almost nothing. It'll come down to okay. something like 20 cents a watt. Um, oh, and, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, in, but then there's the other thing. So there's the, these balance of systems costs. So there's the, the installation, the wiring, the inverter. Um, these are all starting to now dominate the costs of a solar installation. Um, so they're sort of something like, you know, a dollar a watt or something like that. And that's harder to bring those costs down. Um, so essentially, the, you know, silicon costs nothing to make. Even if perovskite costs nothing to make, it couldn't compete unless it can either be cheaper on, you know, some of the other aspects or higher efficiency. Um, and so, oh, okay. Yeah, and so higher efficiency. So you're saying because of because you don't need to have as much other overhead type stuff like the framing and the the wiring. Yeah, and, everything else. and that's so with the lightweight aspects um, that that particularly brings down. So the cost of insulation comes down a lot because we can, you know, you could have one person installing it on a roof, rolling it out, rather than having this complicated racking system that you have to put on your roof. Um, and the, right. and the other thing is efficiency. So we could we can go beyond silicon with these tandems. And so if we increase efficiency, that also brings down the cost of, you know, the entire installation because the cost per watt then comes down because you're producing more power for that same amount of infrastructure. That's really exciting in general. I mean, like the idea of like, I, I think I'd seen, maybe it was in your TED talk, which we'll obviously we'll link it as well. Um, but uh, someone was talking about like the, because it's, you know, quasi transparent as well, maybe even like putting it onto like windows that kind of idea, yeah, and that, and that is and having it, yeah, there. and that, that's that's a real possibility with you know this, uh, the building integrated photovoltaics type model where you can think about you know designing it into the building. Um, I think the, uh, I mean at least the, um, you know the opportunity to produce very large amounts of power is, is reduced with those. That's they're sort of more smaller scale installations. Um, the the rooftop and utility scale solar is sort of where the you know, real opportunity is to. to really make a difference in, in terms of climate change in terms of renewables um powering things Got it. but there are opportunities to do that and, and there, i'm sure we'll start to see um uh, commercialization of, the, of from the building integrated side as well that's great that's yeah that's really exciting well um this is i mean amazing that this stuff is ha- i think personally like i i think about like the fact that people just go and making you know mix some chemicals together and like oh yeah we got a new way to harvest energy that's like kind of the the dream that's like tony stark type stuff yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's amazing um so i appreciate you coming and talking to us about this where can people find out more about you and your research and and maybe even some background info in case they don't understand photovoltaics and yeah so like so that? um well there's, i mean there's a few resources i mean obviously you can check out my own group web page but that may be more on the, on the technical side um there's um well, there's there's a quite a nice website. So pveducation.org um, is is quite a good uh, quite a good resource for finding out about just just photovoltaic technology in general. And they have some quite nice animations and things to explain a bit more on that. Um, I think in terms of perovskites, there's um, there's we had a Scientific American article a few years ago now um, on the opportunity, particularly around these tandems. Um, that that could be quite a good resource for those wanting to find out more. Um, and uh, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of, quite a few articles coming out um, on perovskites and their potential. Um, you know, so there's, there's you know, <laughs> a little, generally little joke can, there with the potential. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but, and I suppose, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I suppose just to make sure it's not just hype, I mean, you know, there are still some challenges that, we do need to solve from the from the lab side and from the from the scale up side, um, and and one of them is is you know we have to make them last on the roof for many years. That's that's a challenge we need to make sure we can yeah um, we can validate, um, and and so we you know we and many others can perform stability tests where you do accelerated lifetime testing, for example, you simulate them being out in the field, putting them stressing them under similar conditions. Um, but that takes time and, you know, to really validate them and for someone to underwrite a panel for 20 years, you really need some very strong and convincing data behind yeah. that. Um, yeah, and, definitely. you know, I always say it's quite, it's funny that, you know, in solar, they have a product that w- they'll guarantee to last for 30 years, which is just amazing, you know, to have an electronic product that can be guaranteed to be operating for that long. 
um, yep. is fantastic. <laughs> so the bar is set, and that, and that's something that does need to be, you know, we, we do need to get there. Um, and I think that there is some encouraging stability data now coming out, but it's something that will take time, and that's why, at least why you know we're not seeing it on the on the shelves today. Um, but I think in the next two to three years, we will start to see the first products, and the next five years really start to see, you know quite a lot of infiltration of, of, of some serious perovskite panels. Awesome. Are you guys, uh, are you taking new students at your, at your lab? Yeah, or absolutely. Is that something yes. should, people should even reach out to? Yeah, about? so please do reach out if you're interested in, in uh, you know, in, in a PhD or, or master's um, uh, or, or postdocs looking at, at these perovskite materials, please do reach out. Um, and uh, likewise, Swift Solar, if, if you're interested in hearing more about it, we have some uh, contact there on our website. You can check out Swift Solar. Um, and, and, and follow us there. Um, yeah, absolutely. We'd love to chat with people interested in, in learning more and, uh, and, and working with them. Great. And, uh, I saw you're on Twitter as well. So we'll, yes. we'll link that, uh, we'll, we'll link that too. Is, is that, that's usually how we, we communicate here at yep. the Amp Hour. So. No, please do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Sam, thanks so much for telling us about this. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on. It's great to chat.